Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad so many of you got the plaid flannel memo. Good job. You look good. All right, Proverbs chapter 13 is where we're headed. If you need a Bible, there are some on the chairs in front of you. Uh, actually, on the few Bibles, it's page 536. If you want a quick way to get there. Kids, well, we're doing that. In your handout today, I've got a challenge for you. I've got to read it so I get it right. So about the first 12 verses of your handout, kids, have comparisons in them. You listening? All right, Zach's paying attention, man. Look at this. All right, so there are comparisons in the first 12 verses. There's some later in the passage. But kids, here's your challenge. I want you to see what is compared to what. It's typically like a godly person versus a not godly person and then does this. Right, And so I want you to identify what is the comparison or contrast being made, and then what does it mean to you? So you've got 12 places to figure that out, and we're going to go through a couple. I'm going to actually, uh, on our first verse, I'll actually talk to you guys and, and kind of explain it a little better. Uh, last week, we focused on how wisdom is a byproduct of connecting to God through His Word, right? Now, wisdom, meaning how God has created us to be is a byproduct of knowing God, and the best way we can know God, or one of, the, one of the key pieces of knowing God, is by being in His Word daily, right? Christians, we need to be in God's Word daily for ourselves, right? Today, we gather together, we open God's Word, we're here together as a family. Now, tomorrow morning when you get up, let me encourage you, Start your day off with Scripture. Be in the Bible every day. Prayer and Scripture. That's a dialogue we should have with God every day. This week, we want to talk about how being a disciple of Jesus really is about being teachable. Now, the word disciple, it sounds like a Bible word, but we use it in other places. If you are learning plumbing or learning jujitsu or learning sewing, you're a disciple, you're a student of someone or something, right? You are learning from another. In martial arts, you're, you're a disciple of maybe your sensei, your professor, whatever it is. In, in sewing, maybe you got someone mentoring you in that, or whatever it might be. Disciple simply means student. Now, when we use it in a Christian context, it means being a student of Jesus, right? We talk about discipleship in the church, where maybe I get together with someone and, and I disciple them, or they disciple me. We're a student learning from someone who more advanced in the faith, right? The same thing would be true if I was going to go learn something new. I could be a disciple of someone to learn that. It just means student. But you and I, as followers of Jesus, are called to be students of Jesus, ongoing students of Jesus. And one of the things that gets in the way is when we stop being teachable, right? When we maybe think we've arrived... And we forget that we haven't arrived yet, right? When we, when we forget that we're constantly learning and constantly changing, and, and that's this life of faith, right? And so being teachable. Proverbs 13, let's start in verse 1. Kids, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. A wise son hears his father instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So here's your first contrast, kids. I told you there's going to be 12 of them that we're asking you for. The first verse is to compare and contrast. Here's how you do it. Notice the but in the middle, right? A wise son hears his father instruction. That's the first part. But a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So Solomon, our author, is comparing a wise son to a scoffer. And a scoffer is someone who like mocks their parents' teaching or mocks the teaching of someone older, wiser, who should be teaching them. So a wise son listens to instruction, but a scoffer doesn't, right? So it's a comparison or a contrasting. And so your job is to find those comparisons, find the contrast in those first 12 verses, and then kind of right below that, what does that mean to you, all right? That's the same thing all the rest of us are going to do today, right? We're looking at what God is teaching us through the words of Solomon, verse 1, a wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So what's the difference between a wise son and an unwise son in this case, who's a scoffer? Listening or hearing. A wise son hears his father's instruction. 
hearing is another way of, say, of, of saying being teachable, right? It isn't just the auditory hearing, like you hear a noise. This is actually listening or learning from, hearing them, right? Not just hearing the sound, but listening, engaging, being taught by them. So a wise son hears his father instruction, the wise son listens, the wise son is teachable, the wise son engages, but a scoffer, the unwise son, does not listen to rebuke, meaning correction. So again, kids, this proverb teaches us to listen and learn, especially from our parents. I would include teachers, pastors, leaders, whatever that might be. But again, this is riddled with contrast. Proverbs 21, we'll put this one up. Scoffer is the name of the arrogant, a haughty man who acts with arrogant pride. And this is the opposite of what we want to be today. A scoffer or arrogant, one who is not teachable, one who thinks, I've got it all handled. Right? And I can tell you, uh, for, at least for me, remember, uh, years of learning, years of studying results in learning lots of things, but the more you learn... I can tell you this, at least for me, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know, right? You learn stuff, and then you're like, okay, i got a handle on this, and then you turn the page, you learn something new, and you're like, there's a whole world out there, right? The more you learn, the more you recognize there's more out there to learn. Verse 2, from the fruit of his mouth, a man eats what is good, but the desire of the treacherous is for violence. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. So there are two comparisons here, both about the mouth. So let's connect a couple things first, right? So we've talked a lot about this. What is it that fuels what comes out of someone's mouth? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I figure if I put that out there in a question, I would have time to take a drink of water. Thank you for filling in the gap. All right. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? What comes from within us comes out of us. We don't have problems with our hands or with our mouth. We have problems with what's inside of us that that drive us, what directs us. So what's the difference between simply hearing and actually listening is actually your heart, right? Now, again, metaphoric heart. We're not talking about the thing that pumps blood, right? We're talking about the center core of our being, right? Right? If our heart, at the center of us, we think we know everything, then we're not listening, we're not hearing, we're not learning. But when our heart says, when our heart makes us humble, when our heart tells us to be teachable, right, then we listen in a different way. So let's go back to these first two, verse two. From the fruit of his mouth, a man eats what is good, but the desire of the treacherous is for violence. So here the contrast is is in the power of speech, the power of words. Wise words are a blessing to others. And when you bless others, you end up becoming a blessing to yourself as well. Mean words hurt others and do damage to the speaker as well. Right? We just got done with an election. It's been a political season. Most of us, no matter who you voted for or how it turned out, you're just glad the political part is primarily over, right? Right? Now, a couple people are spiking the football and a couple people are mourning, but for the most part, right? But go back a month. Amaldi was talking about that he and I were out of town. We were in Colorado uh, for a network gathering. We went on Tuesday, right? So it was that night that the election, uh, that was election day and all that. And so it, it, it dominates the time. But it, it really, what bothers me the most, or what I see the most of each political season, is the speech between people, right? And we're talking about all Americans, right? We're talking about all, maybe, Californians, or all whatever, but very divided, right? We've got a two-party system for the most part, right? So you've got folks on the left, folks on the right. But people say horrible things about those whom they disagree with today, It's no longer, I disagree with you, but we're both human, we're both Americans, we're both whatever we are, we're both Christians, followers of Jesus. Now it's, if we disagree, you're evil. And so you hear it come out in the speech, but let me suggest to you what this is saying 
is when your speech is like that, it not only damages them, but it's doing damage to you as well. Look at the culture we live in and look at the political tenor, look at the speech used, and look at how it's not only tearing others down, but it's degrading us as well. Has this tone in politics made us a kinder nation or a less kind nation? Right? It does damage to the speaker as well as the hearer. That's what verse 2 is about. Verse 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. This is saying something very similar. So if you guard your speech, you stop yourself from saying that mean thing, that dishonest thing, that gossip thing, that whatever thing. When you guard yourself from that, you're, you're not only protecting others, but you're really preserving your own life. Because your negative speech tears you down too. Yes, it adds to a culture. Yes, it, it hurts other people. When you guard your mouth, he says, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. So if you're a note taker, teachability requires humility. In order to be teachable, you must be humble. A common gauge for your humility in the Bible is your speech. Does your speech show you to be humble or prideful? Let me be honest, this one, can be, this one is convicting to me. In a lot of settings, I am teaching, right? So I'm talking a lot. I have to remember and be intentional that I'm not always teaching, right? Example might be marriage, right? <laughs> should be in a different place there. Or in a normal conversation, just remind myself, hey, listen, it is more important for me in those moments to be a listener than a speaker, right? Humility keeps us teachable. Arrogance makes us unteachable. Verse four, the, slow, the soul of the sluggard, as someone who's lazy, craves and gets nothing. Well, the soul of the diligent, the hard worker, is richly some supplied, right? So the comparison is between the sluggard or lazy and the diligent or hard worker. A sluggard is just an old school name for someone who is lazy. And it says that the sluggard has lots of desire, but never achieves it, never gets it, right? The soul of the sluggard craves, but gets nothing. Laziness is antithetical to learning, right? Learning does not come by laying around on your couch eating Doritos, and binging Netflix, right? You're probably not learning in that place, right? Learning actually takes work. And I might tell you that as, as time goes by, learning gets even harder. When you're young, your brain is pliable, and you can learn. And, and I know you're, being, you're learning a lot, so you're taking in a lot. But just consider someone who's born and then at two years old, by the time they're walking and talking, just look how much life they've learned in two years. There's a, st a statistic, and I don't remember the exact age, but like you learn more in the first three years or five years of your life than you do in all the rest of your life put together, right? Because everything is brand new. Your mind is a sponge. You students may feel like you're not learning, but you're learning stuff all the time. As you get older, especially if you don't read or if you don't stay on top of it, it gets harder to learn, right? Learning takes effort. You'll never learn what you need to learn, especially about your faith, just by osmosis, right? Just by being, you're not going to grow and learn. Now, I'll put this on the screen. So learning requires effort. Becoming wise, or more like Jesus, requires effort. Going to church, community groups, discipleship groups, even time spent alone with God, all require your initiative. Lazy people are not good learners. It takes effort to get up earlier than you need to get up to go wherever you're going to go so that you can spend time in prayer in Scripture. Right? It takes energy to get up and make it to church. It takes energy to come back on a Wednesday night. It, it takes energy to make it to your community group or your men's study or women's study or disciple group, group or whatever. It means when you're tired after a long day of work, you still got to go home and read whatever you're reading and study whatever you're studying so you can make it to that group. Laziness will never mature you. Laziness will never grow you. It takes effort to learn. Verse 5. The righteous hates falsehood, 
But the wicked brings shame and disgrace. Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but sin overthrows the wicked. So again, there's two comparisons here, and there'll be another uh, coming up shortly, but there's two comparisons using righteousness versus wickedness. Righteousness is typically defined as moral or ethical character, but righteousness in a biblical context is really becoming more like Jesus, right? So male or female doesn't matter, becoming more Christ-like, becoming more holy, becoming less sinful or more repentant, whatever it might be, but more righteous. It's the opposite of becoming more sinful. The righteous, verse 5, hates falsehood, but the wicked brings shame and disgrace. So people who spread lies bring shame on themselves and others, right? The righteous hate falsehood. Again, consider the things said in this last political season, right? And I mean it. Everybody lied about everybody, right? I mean, like, there wasn't, like, an honest one of the bunch. Verse 6, righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but sin overthrows the wicked. Being more Christ-like actually guards your path, right? But sin is a danger to your life. So the question here is, how do we, how do we move from sinful to righteous? Well, let's back up. Let's back up to the gospel, right? Let's understand God created us, designed us. He made us holy. He made us Sinless, humanity began sinless, right, in Eden with God, right? Humanity was created in the best case scenario, in relationship with God. But humanity chose humanity. Humanity chose to sin. And in that sin, we, all of humanity sinned, and we inherit sin. And then we come along and we add to the sin, and it's not like anybody's sitting here thinking, well, I, I've never sinned, right? Like we all know. And again, I say this often, if, if you meet someone here who's a member here at Generations, we're pretty clear on how jacked up we are. We're pretty honest about how broken. We champion Jesus, not us. Because of our brokenness and our need for a Savior, because of the depth of sinfulness in humanity, there was no way for humanity to work their way back to God, to turn around one day and say, I'm not going to ever sin, or I'm never going to sin again. I'm going to earn my way back to God. That was just off the table. We can never do that. So because we can't reach up to God, we can't work our way to God, God came down to us. The creator of the universe came down, became flesh in Jesus, fully God, fully human met us where we are, where we live, entered into humanity, and then lived the sinless life, the life we're called to live, but we choose not to, and then died a death in our place, re taking the wrath of God for any who would place their life in Christ. So if you place yourself in Jesus, he pays your penalty. He suffers the wrath of God for your bad decisions, for your sin. And gives you new life. As Jesus is laid in the ground, we're forgiven. As he resurrects from the grave, we're given new life. Now, it's, it's at this point, the new life part, that we're going to ask the question, okay, how do we become more righteous? Right? If, if Jesus, and, and looking exactly like Jesus, is way out here and we're back here, well, what do we do? Well, the resurrection gives us that new life. It begins the process of making us more like Jesus. And then Jesus ascends back to heaven, pouring out his spirit upon us who believe, empowering us to make those changes. And then as, as, as God, who is Lord, who is Savior, who is King today, Jesus reigns and teaches us what to do, and, and much of that comes from his word. And so we're told how Jesus wants us to live and how we're created to live and how we're to be, and the word convicts us of sin, the spirit convicts us of sin, of sin and then empowers us to repent. And so we're in this lifelong process of going from who we are or who we were, to who we were created to be in Christ. And this process of change is a process of learning and repenting. All of Christian faith is repentance, because we never arrive. We learn, we overcome something, God overcomes it in us, we repent of something, we change, and then we learn there's more. 
And that, that might sound frustrating, but as we grow and mature, we're growing and maturing. It gets better and better. It's never over, but it gets better and better. The gospel is one that gives us new life. When you trust in Jesus, he gives you new life. You guys, and I use this verse all the time. It is a favorite of mine for sure. Ezekiel 36, 26, where God promises, I will give you a new heart, right? I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I'll remove from you the heart of stone. A new spirit I'll put within you. He promises, I will give you what it takes to cause you to be new. The next verse goes on and says, and I will cause you to obey my commands and, and be careful to follow my laws, right? Like, I will cause the change. Really, much of Christianity is learning to surrender to that. It's not me trying with all my might to look more like Jesus. It's me reading scripture and praying and gathering with other believers and, and learning what's wrong and repenting of that. And really, that repentance is much me surrendering myself to Jesus and allowing the Spirit to make those changes within me that I might look more like Jesus. Insert the word righteousness now. That's what we're talking about. Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but sin overthrows the wicked. Verse 7, one pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. This is really not about wealth, although the comparison is about a rich man and a poor man. A poor man who acts like he's rich. But what it really is, is about deception. It's about integrity of person. Right? Verse 7. One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Right? This is more about being who you really are. There's a, if some of you have done Dave Ramsey, I think we're queued up to do Dave Ramsey, like financial peace again in January. Uh, and it, and it, there's a comment he makes, and, and I'm, I'm probably not going to get it completely right, but like you, you put on this person, this image, right? Like you buy a car you can't afford and live in a house you can't afford and wear clothes you put on credit cards and all to drive around and, and so that other people that you don't know will see you and think you look cool. Like, how dumb is that, right? But a lot of that is, is, is who we are, trying to impress people we don't even know. He says, one pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. So if you're a note taker, this is about living transparently. In order to be teachable, you must be who you really are in front of others. Pretense only prevents you from learning. Let me say that again. In order to be teachable, you must be who you really are. You must be who you really are in front of others, right? Pre pretense, pretending, prevents you from learning. Verse 8, the ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. This is kind of a funny one. I, I, most of us would... I'm going to go with all of us, and you can correct me later if I'm wrong, but all of us would like to have more money. Fair? Okay, I'm in good territory there. John D. Rockefeller, one of the most wealthy men alive back in his day, was asked the question, how much money is enough money? His answer, the gazillionaire, uh, just a little bit more. Right? That's like Elon Musk saying, just a little bit more, right? Or Mark Cuban, right? Like, just a little bit more money. Like, we're like, oh, okay, I could use a little more money. So, Here's what he says, though, and it's kind of a funny quote. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. This is about contentment. It's teaching us that being content with whatever you have, because having more money, you might need be a kidnap victim, it's saying. Like, people don't kidnap poor people for ransom. They kidnap rich people. And we all want to have a little more money, but then sometimes a little more money comes with more problems. And really, this passage isn't about money at all. It's about contentment. Content with who you are, so you're not pretending to be one thing when you're not. And just contentment with what God has blessed you with. In 1 Timothy 6, it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. Godliness with contentment is great gain. If it were a proverb... 
it would say something like we're reading, right? Godliness with contentment is better than a lot of money and a lot of headaches or something, right? That's, that's what he's saying is godliness with contentment is great gain. That is the rich, riches in itself. To be godly and to be content is great. Verse 9, the light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. Again, this is contrasting righteousness with sinfulness like verses 5 and 6. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. Remember, God promises that one day this world will come to an end, right? That this age, this aeon will, will come to an end. And at that point, we will all be judged. We will either be found in Christ, and Christ has paid the penalty for our sins, or we will be found outside of Christ and be judged for our sin eternally. And here, we talk a lot about the gospel, and we talk a lot about living in Christ. We don't talk a lot about eternity. When it comes up, we do. But this is really forward-looking, reminding us that, listen, you don't you're not guaranteed a tomorrow. We don't lead with a lot of, if, and if you died tonight, you'd go to hell, and we're not trying to scare anybody into following Jesus. I'd rather tell you that following Jesus is just better. And we've all experienced that, and if that's not you, it's just better. It's better today, it's better tomorrow, it's better for as long as I live, and when I die, he's got me covered. Literally. Literally. But the Bible over and over reminds us that there will be a day. Jesus talked about hell more than any other biblical author. But there's a unique catch to that. When Jesus was talking about hell, he was always sitting with his disciples. He was never standing on a street corner yelling at people, if you die, did you know you're going to hell? Rather, when he was in public, he led with grace and with love, because as Romans 2 says, the kindness of God, uh, the kindness of God leads a man towards repentance. But when he sat with his disciples, he reminded them that this world's going to come to an end and hell is forever, right? As one guy used to say, hell's hot and forever's a long time. Like that's important. That's an important message to communicate to Christians because we have the gospel and we're called to take it to those who don't know. So I often focus on the gospel and how it relates to us today, but there are eternal aspects that remind us that eternity hangs in the balance and our job as our, uh, as our core value that Pastor Amaldi talked about today was evangelism, right? That it's our job, we're the ones that go share the gospel. You know what we have in common with every other Christian except for a handful? We heard the gospel from another Christian. There's just a small collection of Christians who heard the gospel directly from Jesus. Billions, literally, of Christians throughout history have heard the gospel from another follower of Jesus. And we're just the next link in the chain, right? The name generations has meaning. We stand on the shoulders of those that came before us and paved the way for us to be here today. Our job, be that next link in the chain, reaching the next generation. We couldn't have done it without those before us and the next people after us. That's our job. So share the gospel because heaven and hell remain in the balance. Hebrews 9.27, it says, just as it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes judgment. Right? Just as it was appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Verse 10, by insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Insolence is defined as rude and dis- disrespectful behavior. It typically comes from arrogance and pride. So by insolence comes nothing but strife, right? But listen to the contrast. But with those who take advice is wisdom. So listen to this. Are are you prideful or arrogant? Or are you teachable? Wisdom is with those who take advice, verse 10. We often emulate those around us, right? Do we surround ourselves with teachable people? Do we become like them? Are we teachable or does our pride get in the way? Verse 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, 
but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. These two relate patience and hard work with satisfaction and longevity, right? It, it talks about the difference between slowly, patiently learning and, and growing and, and, and achieving, excuse me, and achieving something. Like we said, being teachable takes work, or, or learning, maturing takes work, right? And it doesn't come overnight. In Sunday school this morning, we were just kind of toying with the question, like, well, why doesn't God just do this, like, like right away, right? And, and we all have those questions, right? Why doesn't God just return, because today's been kind of tough, right? Why doesn't he just make everything right? He's going to do that eventually, so why not now, right? And, and the answers are, we don't know. We're told some things that are true. Not everyone who's going to come to faith yet has come to faith. That's important. We want everybody to be saved. We want that. Somehow there's a refining process in humanity that we're being refined into Christ's likeness, and this is part of the journey, part of the plan. But why? I, I, I don't necessarily know. But what we're taught over and over again, just like this verse, let's reread it, verse 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. So getting rich quick doesn't typically happen or last, right? And there's a tried and true method of saving and building over time in order to build financial security. But this isn't exactly just about money either. This is the same thing you could say about maturity doesn't happen fast. Growth doesn't happen fast. And, and when growth starts happen, sometimes they struggle to stay a part of your life because the next verse is connected to it. Reread verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Patience is learning to work for and wait for what you want or what you need. Remember what we said about the tree of life. There's only three books in the entire Bible that talk about the tree of life. One is the garden before sin. The tree of life is the eternal life that God had created humanity for, and he removes that tree as a bit of a protection. Who wants to live forever like this? right? You want to live forever without sin and pain and, you know, and cold flu season or whatever, right? But then it's talked about again in Revelation when God restores all things, when, when Christ reigns, when the parousia, the, the final return of Christ comes, we, we have the tree of life restored. What was taken is brought back. And the only other book in the entire Bible that talks about a, the tree of life is Proverbs. When it talks about wisdom, wisdom is a tree of life, right? A desire to fulfill is a tree of life. When we learn to work for and patiently strive towards something and we achieve it, it's a tree of life, is what he's saying. A desire fulfilled that you take the time to accomplish, it's like a tree of life. Here's a note we'll put on the screen for you. No overnight solutions. Being wise requires being teachable and learning takes place over time. There is no shortcut to wisdom or righteousness or godliness. There's no shortcut. There's no overnight solution. You can't come to faith one day and just magically or, or whatever, overnight, become Christ-like. It takes time. It takes effort. It requires that we are teachable, that we actually punch in the work, right? That we do what God calls us to do. God doesn't call us to do things just to call us to do things. God calls us to do things because they're what's right for us. When I stand up and make a statement like I did last week and, and repeated it this week that we should be in Scripture every day, I win nothing if you're in Scripture every day. Right? I, I get no gain from that. You do. But God calls us to that because God knows that's what's best for us. God knows that we need that, and that not just being in Scripture, but being in prayer, and that gathering regularly with others, right? Those are not for us, they're, they're for you, they're from God for you, and they're not from God for you just because God wants to make rules and tell you what to do, it's because it's what gives you life. It's what transforms your heart, it's what grows you and matures you, but it takes time, you must be teachable and humble, and you've got to put in the work. Verse 13, whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. 
Good sense wins favor, but the way of the treacherous is their ruin. Now again, this is a truism. Proverbs are truisms. They're not promises. I can't promise you that if you get up tomorrow and every day after that and read the Bible and pray and devote yourself to that, you're never going to have struggles or setbacks or sin. I can't. But what we know is it's true that that grows you, that guards you, that protects you, that teaches you, that causes you to repent, which in the end results in a better life, right? In a more godly life, and it protects you from making bad decisions that will cause yourself harm. So the truth is, however, doing wise things leads to life, and doing foolish things leads to death. Those are the, those are the true things. One who despises the word, it says, whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself. Now, I want to remind you, when we think of the word, we always think of scripture, right? Well, okay, God's word. But I want to remind you, I'm just going to read you a little verse out of John chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He, not the Bible, he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. The word is Jesus. Right? The word of God, the very speech of God is Jesus. Right? We forward down to John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus. When we reject the word of God, we're truly rejecting Jesus. Because we didn't get these because of human beings. We got these because God spoke. And he spoke through human beings, and they captured it and wrote it down. But this is the word of God, that Jesus breathes out truth. The Proverbs through Solomon, or the Gospels through Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. The letters through Paul and Peter, John, the author of Hebrews. When we reject the word of God, we're truly rejecting Jesus. If you're a note taker, let me give you this too. When we talk about the value of God's word, remember scripture is great and we should all read the Bible more. But it's not just a message, it's a person. The Bible reveals to us Jesus, it's not just a how to live manual. See, the how to's do come, but they're how to live in Christ. We're not seeking it for just a better life. Like if we go to Proverbs and we take all the, the, all the verses about money and we live them out, we will do financially better. There are truths in there that are true. To not be indebted to this, to that, to save a little here and there, know well the condition of your flocks or your finances, whatever you want to say there. Like all that's true, but that's not what it's written for. It's written for how to live in Christ. That Jesus is the pursuit and then having a life here of wisdom is how to live in Christ. Verse 16, every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. So prudence is another word for wise. So every wise man acts with knowledge. Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly, right? The wise take the knowledge they have learned and they apply it to their lives. The fool, folly, just does whatever. And obviously that lands and ends in pain. And another note for you we'll put up on the screen. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Let's kind of separate these out. Knowledge is learning facts. Understand is applying knowledge to your personal situation. And wisdom is produced as you live out what you know and understand. Right? Knowledge is learning. You learn facts. You learn things. You learn what's true. You learn what's false. Right? Understanding is when you learn them and you learn how to apply them to your life. That's understanding. Wisdom is the product of that. It's being able to take the things that are said and learn the values and adapt them to everything. That's wise living. So knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Verse 17. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful envoy brings healing. This is about truthfulness. So here's a question for you. Would you rather have someone tell you the truth, even if it's bad, or lie to you and not have the opportunity to get help? Right? If you love someone, how unloving is it to not tell them the truth? Even if the truth is going to be hard to hear. When you love someone, you will find a way to tell them the truth, hard as it may be, 
because that allows everybody a chance to course correct or fix whatever. Verse 18, poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores this instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is honored. Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction. I have a, a story for you. I remember one time, a long time ago, I, I want to say middle school, so long time ago, right? A lot longer than I'd like to admit to. So a long time ago, all right? And we were given this test, and they, and they, or a quiz or a test or whatever. It was long. I know it was lengthy, so we'll go with test because that feels appropriate for this. And, we were, and, and the teacher said this, read the whole thing before you start. You ever been told that before? Teachers in here, you ever said those words? Yeah, I didn't. So I filled out my name, probably did the date. I started answering questions because I'm in a hurry. I want to get done. I'm always in a hurry, so I always want to get done, right? And as you read through page one and you read through page two and I'm answering as I go and I'm doing all this stuff and it's super hard and we get to the back of the bottom of page two, you know what the last thing said? Put your name on the paper and go turn it in. You know what I've never forgotten? Read everything first, right? <laughs> right, so I, I learned a lesson, but I want you to hear now, and hear my dumb story. I have tons of dumb stories because I do tons of dumb things, and I have a life that is pretty much defined by doing dumb things. So, verse 18, poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof or the instructions is honored. If I had listened and done as instructed, I would not have had to take the entire test and would have had a lot less work to do. Fair? A lot less. Can you imagine being the teacher sitting there watching me frantically scribble away and answer these questions to the best of my ability, thinking he didn't do what I said, right? Still didn't get done first. Yeah, and that's got to be God looking down on us, right? Like, I gave you lots of instructions. Did you not listen? Verse 19, a desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but to turn away from evil is an abomination to fools. Pretty straightforward. I, I just, if you're a note taker, we're talking about a fulfilled life here. Jesus desires to give us a life of fulfillment, but we often choose a different road. Foolishness is believing we know better than the God who created us. And foolishness here equals sin, Right? God has created us to have a full life, to have a good life. We were made to enjoy the world God put in us, or God put us in, excuse me. That we were designed to enjoy relationships and, and the world we live in, even to enjoy the work we do and, and whatever. But we so often choose a different road that we've broken the whole thing. And then we go down a different road, we do what God has said not to do, or we don't do what God has said to do, and we look up and wonder why life isn't going the way we would have it go. Verse 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Consider your friends, your crowd, and the impact they will have on you. Again, something I was told as a kid, you are who you surround yourself with, right? and didn't listen, and it was true, and I became who I surrounded myself with, right? And that is not a positive thing. Verse 21, disaster pursues sinners, but the righteous are rewarded with good, right? Again, righteous contrasted with sinners again, right? Faith and obedience, they result in a benefit. There's a reality that no one's perfect, but living a life of faith is always better than living against how Jesus has redeemed us to be. Right? We, when we talk about the gospel, we talk about how God created us to be, but then sin enters and ruins that, wrecks that, and then we're all born under the curse of that. But see, the cross redeems. Right? It begins to remake us into how God intended us to be. It reconciles a sinful humanity with a holy God. It puts us in relationship with God our Father, right? adopting us in to His family. We really are changed and how we are redeemed to be. So we can never reclaim what was intended at first. But through Christ, we can work our way back there. Christ has done the work, don't get me wrong. But in Christ, we can learn 
how to be obedient, how to follow what God has created us for, and live a better life, live a life of fulfillment. Listen to the comparisons in these final verses here. Verse 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. Verse 23, the fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it's swept away through injustice. Verse 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. 25, the righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked suffers want. I'll come back to verse 24 in just a second, but for now, verses 22 through 25 have a theme. And they really aren't about wealth, but rather contentment and wisdom again. Wisdom results in not needing to spend every dollar you make as soon as you have it. Again, leaving an inheritance for your children. Contentment allows us to be joyful and content with less. Remember that passage. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now verse 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. The entire book of Proverbs is written... By Solomon, he collected some Proverbs from others. Some are original to him, but he writes it, and he he writes this book to his son. So Solomon is writing to his son. The desire of this father-to-son book is to communicate wisdom, to teach what it looks like to live in God's wisdom. So the tone of the book is a tone of love from a father to a son, which reminds us, That it's from God our Father to us as sons and daughters. That the desire is to give us the life that we want and need, to teach us how to live in that, and the tone is love. Love has correction. Love has encouragement. Love has learning that you can learn ahead of time and not have to make some of the dumb mistakes that you might make without that. But love includes discipline. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. If you love your children, you will discipline them. Without discipline, they will never learn how to be good humans or faithful Christ followers. Discipline is required. Discipline is loving. Discipline is always to the end of restoration. Right? Discipline is not just punitive. Discipline is to restore them to right living. So here's a couple more verses like this. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. Kids, today is a really, really good day for you to be obedient with your parents armed with these verses now. I'm just throwing that out there. Wisdom would say, today's a good day to act right. Just like we're called to teach and discipline our kids, we too need to be teachable. So how can we be teachable as Jesus has called us to be? Here's some other Proverbs. We'll walk through some of these. The first one, command to be teachable. Proverbs 1.8, hear my son your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching. There's a few others like that. Again, all these verses will be in the app if you need them. But there is a command to be teachable. Next one, warning to those who are not teachable. Proverbs 12, 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. I love that one. I do. I didn't write it. But it sure sounds like me. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. He who hates reproof is stupid. Hating correction. That means you're doing something wrong, and someone is trying to tell you it's wrong. You hate correction. Solomon say, that's stupid. Next slide is, promise to be to the teachable. Proverbs 7, 2 says, keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. There's, there's a promise within this, right? If you keep the teachings of God, you will live, like live eternally and have life here today. Again, we don't often get to when you die or judgment or whatever until it comes up. We talked about it today, but you'll live. Like today, you'll actually have a good life. Next one, pride prevents teachability. Scoffer is the name of the arrogant, haughty man who acts with arrogant pride. Right? There's a, another one in, in 16, 5 and 6. 
Next one, laziness prevents teachability. This was from today's passage, but I felt it could be said again. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. You can also see in 26, 14, and 16. Last one, humility fosters teachability. Proverbs 15 says, The fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Humility comes before honor. Humbling yourself and learning and recognizing that none of us know everything comes before you are honored, before your life is honorable. So takeaways, what application will you make today? What is something you heard today that you want to apply to your life this week? Considering some categories. For myself, I was convicted, I told you this earlier, I was convicted by the humility in speech. Again, I teach a lot, so I get in the habit of speaking, but I want to make sure I listen just as much. The saying is two ears, one mouth, right? Mature believers, you're never too mature to learn and be teachable. Humility and teachability is a marker of maturity. And you are the ones also to teach others. If you're new to walking with Jesus, your best attribute when you're young in your faith is to know that you don't know everything and seek to learn everything about Jesus and Scripture that you can. Be a sponge, attend everything, grow and mature. If you are not a follower of Jesus yet, the world around you lies to you about what is right and wrong, what is good and bad, and what is satisfying in life. That's why our world is filled with depression and pain, and why so much pain defines us. Jesus offers a new way to live for him. Humble yourself and surrender your life to Jesus. Kids, this one is just for you. Kids, be teachable. Your parents love you. Jesus loves you. We as adults in the church love you. We want the best for you. Let us lead you towards Jesus. Let's take a couple minutes. Let's find some people around you and share what is your takeaway. Something you heard today, you want to apply to your life this week. And folks from the church, make sure nobody please gets left out.